Hey you guys, welcome back to the salon, and here we are already on the fourth installment of this seemingly endless series, which I think I said the same thing last time. Like I said, I don't know why I got myself into this, but I mean, you know, it's been fun and it does make for good content. So we're talking about 1975, my top five horror movies from 1975. And again, I've run into a problem where a particular year actually provides too many uh, delicious, delectable options to cram into one top five list. So for the first time in this series, I'm just going to have to give like a very brief tip of the hat to a couple of honorable mentions before we get into the list proper. These were just like a couple of films that I really debated like back and forth, like which ones I wanted to put on the list. And I just felt too bad, like leaving them off because I do really like them. So before we get into the top five, I'm going to tell you the two films that just barely got edged out were the Rocky Horror Picture Show, uh, which I absolutely adore and have seen a million times. I actually used to go every week uh, to the theater and did all the participation and everything. I guess I left that off because I figured, well, it's not exactly a horror movie, even though it does have horror components, and it absolutely is on Wikipedia's list of horror movies that came out in 1975. Uh, you know, but I was just kind of like, I d went back and forth, and I was just like, well, I guess that's reason enough for leaving it off. Uh, and uh, the other honorable mention being the excellent made-for-TV anthology film Trilogy of Terror uh, directed by Dan Curtis and starring of course Karen Black in all three segments um, and honestly the that movie is just stellar all around but is mostly iconic for the third segment like with the little Zuni warrior that comes to life and chases her around and all that kind of stuff even though like I said the whole thing is good but you know those two movies easily could have been on this list as well because I went back and forth but I just wanted to mention them like outside of the top five so you wouldn't think that like I forgot it was like what about this one what about that one okay so I'm mentioning them right now. So all that out of the way, let's get into my top five favorite horror movies from 1975. So this is uh, Dario Argento's fifth film as director, uh, also known, maybe better known, I don't know if it's better known, but it's also known by its Italian title, which is Profondo Rosso. Uh, this is actually widely considered one of the best giallo films ever made. Not only one of Dario Argento's best films, but one of the best giallo films uh, ever made in general. And I absolutely do uh, concur with that assessment. Matter of fact, uh, the office where I'm recording this, right there, hanging on the wall, you can't see it because it's behind the camera, but I actually have a Profondo Rosso uh, poster right there less than three feet away as we speak. So there's that. All of Dario Argento's beloved uh, filmmaking signatures are in this one. There's just these grotesquely beautiful and also awesomely improbable kills. Uh, has like a really lush like Art Nouveau interiors, which I love. I love the, um, the House of the Screaming Child, I think it's called in there which I think was actually a convent or, convent or something like that. It is a real place, obviously, where they shot it. I think it's called Villa Scott or something like that. And it was just like those windows, just like the whole time like that I'm watching the movie, I was just kind of like, hmm, like the whole time because it was just like ridiculously gorgeous. I couldn't take it. Um, but yeah, you have that. And you, then you have the, like those really fluid, like flowing camera movements, that amazing score by Goblin, which actually I can listen to. It's probably my second favorite uh, Goblin score after Suspiria. Um, you know, the focus on childhood trauma, like causing uh, problems later on, and the solution to the mystery being predicated upon remembering one very small but forgotten detail. So at the beginning of the story, uh, we have a German psychic named Helga, who's actually played by a French actress named uh, Masha Merrill, Masha Merrill, something like that. Uh, she's giving a performance in a theater when she, oh, oh and uh, incidentally, I was going to say too that this open, this scene where she's in the theater, like given, doing her thing, uh, that's actually where David Cronenberg got the idea for the psychic kind of convention thing in Scanners. So I just thought I would bring that up. That's, he's uh, directly homaging this scene in this movie. Uh, so yeah, so she's giving a performance in a theater when she senses that somebody in the audience is a murderer who is actually planning to kill again. Now, because the murderer overhears her saying that she could identify who this individual was, uh, the killer later pays her a visit and chops her up with a meat cleaver and like kind of, you know, pushes her out the window and like breaks her, it breaks the glass and like kind of like uh, severs her neck or whatever. So happens though, that her upstairs neighbor, who is an English pianist named Mark Daly, who's played by David Hemmings, 
Uh, he was out in the street, kind of coming home after a night out, Who and he's hanging out with his friend, uh, Carlo. Now, Carlo is actually played by uh, Gabriele Lavia, who was also in a couple of other Dario Argento movies. He was in Inferno, and I think he was in Sleepless, too, like much later on. So Mark, the pianist, he sees the murder in progress, like through the window, and rushes up there to help her. But by the time he gets there, of course, uh, she's already dead. Now, while he's looking out at the street from the woman's apartment, like from the broken window, he sees a person in a brown raincoat walking away from the building and presumes that this was probably the killer. That's what he tells the police. A seemingly inconsequential detail keeps bothering him, though. When he saw the murder from the street, he could have sworn that he saw a painting on the wall of the apartment. But when he went up there to help and to talk to the police and kind of walked around the place and stuff like that, the painting that he saw evidently isn't there or isn't in the place where he remembered it. Like he doesn't see it in there anywhere. Now he tells Carlo about this and Carlo, who's drunk at the time, he uh, hypothesizes, oh, the painting was probably removed because it represented something important. And over the course of the movie, Mark kind of gets more and more obsessed with discovering the significance of what he saw and determining who the killer is. And in this endeavor, he is ably assisted by a journalist uh, named Gianna Brezzi, who is actually played by Daria Nicolodi. Now, she, I believe, met Dario Argento on this film, like, or when she auditioned for it, and uh, obviously, you know, became romantically involved with him not long after. Uh, she would later co write the screenplay again of course for uh argento's classic suspiria from 1977 and she would also appear in several more of his films they actually separated in 1985 but i think the last movie that she did with him was opera from 1987 so they still had like a working relationship after that so i mean of course because it's argento uh the visuals and deep red are stunning but I really, really like the murder mystery here. It's very, very intriguing and it just kind of pulls you right in. Um, the kills are just like way over the top and so awesome. I read somewhere that Dario wanted, he's like, well, most people don't have the experience of like, for example, being stabbed or shot. So a lot of the kills in this, he wanted to make it violence that more people could relate to. So to that end, like one guy in there, <laughs> One guy in there, like, the killer comes in and smashes his teeth, like, repeatedly against various corners of furniture, <laughs> like, and it's, like, so, like, visceral. I was just like, oh, I forgot all about that. It's, like, so, it looks so painful. Um, so, yeah, and then he gets stabbed in the neck, too, but that happens beforehand. And, like, I love the scene, too, like, prior to that happening, you have that weird, like, proto saw, like, proto jigsaw kind of thing where, like, this mechanical doll kind of like walks into the room and he's just like what the fuck it's just like such a what the fuck moment i love it but yeah he this guy gets his teeth bashed all over uh one of the one of the victims gets dragged behind a garbage truck for several blocks with his head bouncing off the curbs and stuff like that then the garbage truck guys like apt like find out like they're like oh shit there's a guy like stuck on the back of the garbage truck and then they stop and then a car comes like and runs over the dude's head <laughs> and it's just like it's like too much it's too much uh one victim also gets their head pulled off after their long necklace gets caught in the machinery of a descending elevator so you know it's very very gruesome but it's also like really gorgeous and it has like a lot of really fun kind of Freudian touches, a lot of funny stuff about like Battle of the Sexes kind of stuff, which I always found really amusing. And I'm going to say too that I think this is the first Argento film that can legitimately be called a masterpiece. And it's easily one of his best ones and one of the best Giallo movies, if not the best Giallo movie ever made. So how the fuck can anyone anywhere on the planet not love Jaws. I don't think I've ever met, I'm sure there's one out there, but I don't think I've ever met a single person that doesn't love Jaws. How can you not love Jaws? It's like, it's awesome. Not only was Jaws the first movie to establish the so-called summer blockbuster model, uh, you know, where you have a big crowd-pleasing movie that comes out simultaneously in thousands of theaters accompanied by a big expensive marketing blitz. Um, I don't know if people like the younger people today know, but prior to this 
go, coming out. Um, most films were actually rolled out slowly, like in like it would open in the big cities first, and they'd kind of like gauge the reaction to it, and then they would slowly kind of roll it out across the markets or across the rest of the country. And a lot of the stuff was uh, kind of predicated on word of mouth. You know what I mean? They didn't really do like a lot of TV or anything like that prior to Jaws. Jaws was kind of the first one that had like a big TV advertising campaign. Movies, they generally didn't like to fuck with TV, so this was kind of the first time that that had been done. Jaws is also just kind of one of those rare perfect movies that just gets every single thing exactly right. Um, you know, from the characters, characterization, to the pacing, the suspense, the special effects, like everything in this movie is just absolutely perfect. I wouldn't change a single thing about Jaws because it's just, it's perfect the way it is. So it was directed, of course, by Steven Spielberg, uh, and Jaws had an enormous uh, cultural impact. I mean, basically, it spawned an entire industry of low-budget killer shark knockoffs that is still continuing to this day. This many decades later, they're still making, like, <laughs> knockoff killer shark movies. And it also cemented, you know, catchphrases like, you're going to need a bigger boat, you know, smile, you son of a bitch, you know, the black eyes like a doll's eyes, like that kind of stuff. Like, just cemented all these memes and, like, catchphrases into the public consciousness. I mean, just the theme music alone, which, of course, was composed by you know, the Hollywood legend John Williams is instantly recognizable to 99.999% of the world's population. And I have to say, too, that Jaws was so effective just as a straight up scary monster movie that it made everybody justifiably like afraid to go in the goddamn ocean. I mean, hell, I'm still afraid to go in the ocean. And I saw this fucking movie like 40 something years ago. I mean, and I grew up right by the ocean too. So I've actually like seen sharks in real life. None as big as Jaws, obviously, but you know, so I kind of grew up around it. So I always thought they were really scary. Uh, the bad side of that though, was that because this movie had such a huge cultural impact, it also ended up kind of fucking sharks over a little bit because people became so terrified of sharks that fishermen really started having no qualms about just killing them en masse and conservation groups really had a bitch of a time after this came out convincing people that sharks were worthy of protection and weren't usually you know kind of the man munching horror fish that you see in this movie. Jaws is also in my humble opinion uh, one of the handful of films where the movie adaptation was miles better than the source novel and I don't say that lightly. Peter Benchley's book is fine. I read it several years ago, but it does contain a pointless and kind of awkwardly sexually graphic subplot about Ellen Brody carrying on an extramarital affair with Matt Hooper. And there's also some stuff about the mayor of Amity having, having mafia ties, which, you know, doesn't really tie into the stuff. And it's just kind of pointless, like I said. So the movie wisely trims out all of that fat in order to focus solely on the main conflict, which, of course, is your three principal characters. Uh, you know, Roy Scheider's kind of harried everyman police chief, Martin Brody. You got Richard Dreyfus playing this real enthusiastic, kind of nerdy, but also, also kind of awesome, like, oceanography. Matt Hooper, and most famously uh, and most awesomely, Robert Shaw's grizzled old shark hunter, Quint, uh, you know, as they track down and kill this enormous great white shark that has already snacked on a number of tourists and townsfolk prior to the upcoming 4th of July weekend. One of the most amazing aspects of Jaws for me, uh, and probably for lots of other people too, is that it's unshakable status as kind of like the quintessential and universally beloved thrill ride of 70s cinema happened in spite of it having a notoriously troubled production. Everything that could go wrong on this shit went wrong. Uh, the film ended up going way over budget. I think it was like more than twice what it was originally supposed to cost. It went way past its allotted deadline, like it went way over time. Steven Spielberg, for verisimilitude, uh, insisted on shooting in the actual ocean, which actually did, uh, you know, that made the movie like lots more awesome, but nobody had really done it before. Uh, and that caused like a bunch of delays and technical problems and stuff like that. They had to wait out because sometimes actual boats would be going by in the shot and all this other kind of crap. They had all kind of problems. Uh, Robert Shaw, who played Quint, was drunk a lot of the time, and uh, him and Richard Dreyfuss, I think, didn't really get along. 
and most notably, most famously, the three state-of-the-art mechanical sharks, uh, collectively known as Bruce, that were built for the film barely worked uh, in the salt water, and that kind of forced Steven Spielberg to keep the main monster off screen and only implied for much of the film's runtime. Like you just see a fin, or you just see it like you just see its impact. Like you just see it like kind of pulling you know people into the water and shit like that. This last disaster, however, ended up kind of having a silver lining because showing the shark less ended up generating a lot more suspense and making the scenes where the shark did appear like have a lot more impact. So it ended up working in the film's favor like gangbusters, you know? So, I mean, while it could be said that Jaws, you know, made lemonade out of lemons or caught lightning in a bottle, I mean, both of those phrases are true as far as it goes. I do think a great deal of the credit for the film's success can actually be attributed to Steven Spielberg's direction. Um, he had just had a very, and he was quite young when this was made. I think he was only in his eight, late 20s or early 30s, I believe. And this was kind of his first big budget uh, film. But he had uh, that confidence and he had a real creative way of working around all the problems and ended up producing something that was like really, really special. Um, big props also have to be given to the three main actors in this film who, I mean, they're just like the heart and soul of the story. They just bring such a fantastic dynamic to their character interactions. And so they made the scenes e that didn't even have like kills or the shark in it or anything like that were still like really, really entertaining just because these three guys playing off each other was just so fun to watch. I mean, Jaws is a classic and it's a movie that everybody, everybody needs to see at least one time. So this is one of the kind of preeminent works, I guess, of the 1970s Australian New Wave. Uh, and this is Picnic at Hanging Rock, directed by Peter Weir. Now, this is a very eerie, dreamlike kind of film. I don't even know if it's more, it's not really like straight up horror. It's kind of more like a mystery, but it's just kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's a weird, like, I don't even know what genre I'd call it. It's just this real enticing mystery that really kind of refuses to be solved. It's a very, it's an inscrutable enigma that defies easy analysis. Uh, it's based on a similarly cryptic 1967 novel by Joan Lindsay. And the movie Picnic at Hanging Rock is haunting precisely because it's so ambiguous and so open to interpretation. And I will say that I think its critical and commercial success, as well as its lingering legacy, I mean, the movie was uh, very influential, particularly to filmmakers like Sofia Coppola. And uh, it actually got a reboot in 2018 uh, as a six episode miniseries. But it just goes to show that horror doesn't need to be overt to really kind of get under your skin and be super, super creepy. So the movie, uh, as the novel did before it, um, hints that it was based on true events, uh, though subsequent investigation has shown this to be very highly unlikely. It's set in 1900 in Victoria, Australia, and the story follows a group of young women at a boarding school, which is called Appleyard College. And it's sort of like a, you know, Victorian era finishing school for proper young ladies. You know, they teach them how to dress and walk and comportment and all that kind of stuff. Now, it's Valentine's Day of 1900, and the very stern headmistress of the institution has planned a day out for the students. Uh, they're going to go on this pleasant afternoon picnic to Hanging Rock, which is a nearby geological formation. So most of the girls go out on this trip. Um, the one troublemaker named Sarah is forced to stay behind, and they get chaperoned there by two other teachers. Now, nothing much seems amiss at first, though one of the chaperones, who's a math teacher named Miss McCraw, and the buggy driver who brought them there, whose name is Ben Hussey, they both note that their watches have inexplicably stopped at 12 o'clock. Uh, which kind of hints at maybe some possible paranormal shenanigans afoot. Other than that, uh, the day kind of passes very languidly. Everyone's just kind of like hanging out in their chairs and reading and whatever. Um, but then four of the girls, whose names are Miranda, Marion, Irma, and Edith, they decide to go explore Hanging Rock, like go climb up on it and stuff. 
Now, two men who are also spending an, the afternoon at the site, like with a separate group, uh, the guy's name is Michael Fitzhubert, and he has a friend named Albert. Uh, they actually see the girls as they cross the stream, like on their way to the rock or the monolith. So the girls kind of, they shuck off their shoes and their stockings and everything like that. Cause you know, they have Victorian era. It's like, you know, very impractical like clothing on, corsets and the whole deal. Uh, and they start climbing up on the rock. But then they start experiencing very, very odd phenomena. Like they sort of fall into this trance-like sleep near the summit. And not long after they wake up, three of the girls wander into this kind of like crevice in the rock and are thereafter never seen again. Now, the fourth girl, Edith, doesn't go in there and she's freaking out. She's like terrified. She runs down to tell the others about like the three girls disappearing. And after the party arrives back at the school, it's also discovered that Miss McCraw, the math teacher, she's also vanished. Though Edith actually remembers seeing her climbing the rock, um, wearing only her underwear for whatever reason, and also recalls seeing this really weird like reddish cloud. So the rest of the movie basically details like the aftermath of this bizarre disappearance, both in regards to Mrs. Appleyard and the other girls at the school, and also with the obsession that develops with Michael Fitzhubert, um, because he pretty much, since he saw the girls before they disappeared, he becomes determined to figure out what happened up there, like where they went. So now through his efforts, uh, one of the girls, Irma, is eventually found alive, but she actually can't remember a goddamn thing and thus cannot be any help in the investigation. And there's also like a lot of weird stuff where they never do find her shoes, but her, you know, her feet aren't cut up. Like they, she doesn't have her corset on and there's like all kind of like weird hinted, like what might have happened to her, but she doesn't remember anything. So the movie actually leaves the mystery of what happened at Hanging Rock and where the girls went completely unresolved. And this really frustrates some viewers still to this day. But honestly, to my mind, the ambiguity only makes the whole thing that much creepier because in spite of the, I don't know, like the ethereal unreality of the film as a whole, a lot of real life disappearances end up just like this with people seemingly vanishing into thin air without a trace and there's just no clue to their whereabouts ever being found. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like realistic and unrealistic at the same time, which I find really fascinating. Um, the movie actually does give sort of tantalizing hints that the girls maybe possibly wandered into some sort of alternate dimension or like a time rift, like maybe there's some overlapping timelines or something like that. Um, there are also some thematic elements suggesting a conflict between the real buttoned up sexuality of the girls and the unpredictable wildness of nature, because there is some hint that a couple of the girls are kind of like um, romantically interested in one another. So there's that kind of thing, too. Um, and there's also there's a mirroring conflict also between the largely, I guess, colonialist like British characters and the indigenous uh, myths surrounding the rock, like the indigenous people that live around there and have like their own myths about it. But these things are just hinted. They're just suggestions. They're just little wisps that are kind of like waved in front of the viewer. The point of the puzzle of the movie isn't to solve it. You're just kind of supposed to bask in its unknowability, I guess, or that's kind of how I always took it. I will note, however, that the novel actually did originally contain a final chapter, chapter 18, that made the supernatural time rift scenario um, a lot more explicit. And it also featured a character transforming into an animal, thus also making explicit the whole uh, indigenous myth kind of uh, angle as well. Now at the publisher's request at the time the novel came out, uh, it was left out of the original printing and only later saw the light of day. I believe it was in 1987. They actually released it as a standalone book, which is called The Secret of Hanging Rock. Um, that book also, it's, I mean, because the actual, the final chapter is not long. I think it's only 12 pages or something like that. So the rest of the book is filled out with other authors, like contributions about what they think about the theories around what happened to the girls and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, so there is that if you really do want to, delve into like oh was it supernatural apparently the original author from the 1960s she did write a more clear i don't even know if it's clear it's still weird but it's clearer than the movie like it's not left quite as ambiguous in a 1996 poll of filmmakers film scholars and other industry professionals incidentally a uh, picnic at hanging rock was named as the best australian film of all time so there's that <laughs> 
So you guys probably know, I've always been a big fan of David Cronenberg and uh, his kind of particular brand of filmmaking, which a lot of his stuff, I think, kind of juxtaposes this real clinical, soulless, corporate kind of framework against this real icky, squicky, like grotesque body horror that's like really squishy. Now, in my estimation, I think he didn't really hit his stride until 1979 with The Brood, which I will probably turn up on that year's favorites list now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, His 1975 film Shivers, also known as They Came From Within, also known as The Parasite Murders, is pretty outstanding nonetheless. And it really kind of demonstrates how, like what a distinct and singular vision that he had even, you know, in his earliest days when he didn't really have much of a budget and wasn't like working with a whole lot. So Shivers is set in a swanky Montreal apartment building. And it deals with, at first, like there's a couple of doctors who initially seemed like they were trying to perfect a parasite that could be inserted into people's bodies to take over the function of a failed organ, which seems like it would probably be a good idea. One of the doctors, though, decided that humans were getting entirely too cerebral for their own good. And so he sought to develop a parasite that was more akin to something that would be like an aphrodisiac, but also like a venereal disease. So it would spread from person to person and revert humans back to their simple primal state. I mean, essentially rendering people too into like fucking and fighting to do any of that highfalutin thinking jazz because he thought we were just doing entirely too much of that and we were getting too far up our own ass, I guess. Not surprisingly, uh, the parasite ends up getting loose and goes on to infect several other residents and employees of the apartment complex, soon turning the building into a tumultuous orgy of sex and violence. Uh, The parasite itself, which looks uncomfortably like an emancipated penis, just going about its little wild weenie ways, all (laughs) footloose and fancy free, crawling around like that, um, inserts itself into people's mouths and into their other orifices, uh, most memorably swimming up uh, Barbara Steele's little squish mitten there while she's chilling out in the bathtub. uh, And that provides some pretty revolting uh, (laughs) and also entertaining visuals, uh, which very clearly, especially that Barbara Steele's bathtub scene, Uh, very clearly inspired uh, James Gunn, uh, his movie Shivers, which came out in 2006. I think even the worms kind of look like you can tell that he was homaging uh, Shivers big time. So this movie, actually, it kind of has a really cold alien sort of vibe to it. It makes it kind of like uncomfortable to watch, almost like the movie is keeping you at arm's length, keeping you at one remove. But for me, that kind of like adds to the entire experience. The entire, it's the strangeness of it, you know, and it's very low budget, clearly. But I think, like I said, that kind of like feeds into the whole like weird... I don't know, just this whole weird vibe that this has. Interestingly, too, like, I kind of feel like the parasite angle is kind of, like, fascinatingly equivocal. Like, in some situations, this parasite seems to be, like, positive, like, where it loosens people's unnecessary repressions and fosters more, op- like, sexual openness between people that are already infected, but it also leads to some real pretty horrific uh, consequences because the infected people actually seem to have no compunction about, like, raping the non-infected people, even if they're members of their own family, so... You know, there's some weird shit going on in that. Uh, So the whole movie also is kind of laced with black humor as well. Um, And I kind of feel like maybe Cronenberg is satirizing the way that our civilized veneers of respectability have always just been a very thin mask over our, you know, very primal, brutish selves. Um, And the parasites, I feel like maybe he's saying, are just forcing us to be honest about that, like about all these dark desires that we've always tried to keep hidden previously. I'm Maybe and I'm reading more into it that he didn't mean, but that's kind of how it always came across to me anyway. Like I said, it's not my favorite Cronenberg by a long stretch, but it's still a pretty damn good movie. And speaking of satire, here's another movie that uses black humor to get its point across, while also being uh, pretty subtly terrifying at the same time. 
So The Stepford Wives is based on an excellent 1972 novel by Ira Levin, who, of course, also wrote Rosemary's Baby. Uh, both of those books are, are amazing, like so, and I really recommend them if you haven't read them. Um, and the movie version was actually adapted for the screen by William Goldman, who won a couple Oscars for, he wrote the screenplays for like All the President's Men and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, he also wrote the original source novel for The Princess Bride and adapted that for the screen as well. And I think he also wrote the novel and the screenplay for Marathon Man. Uh, so, you know, it's fucking big deal. You know what I mean? He's written like so much classic shit. And I will say too, I think The Stepford Wives is another one of those movies that has seeped so far into the cultural fabric that even people that have never read the book or even or seen the movie are almost guaranteed to know what you mean when you compare someone to a Stepford wife, who's like, ooh, am I in Stepford? Like most people will know exactly what you mean, even if they haven't even seen the movie. So I just feel like it's really like ingrained in the cultural fabric at this point. Now, some critics at the time that this came out um, actually decried the movie for kind of making fun of the women's liberation movement. But I'm going to completely disagree with that. In my view, the film was doing no such thing. In fact, I think it was doing exactly the opposite of that. Um, if anything, I think The Stepford Wives is satirizing the men characters of the piece, like not the women, um, because it's saying essentially, at least in my interpretation, that the men in Stepford are so frightened and emasculated by their liberated wives being on equal footing to them that they'll go so far as to kill them and essentially like replace them with sex bots that will only look and act exactly as the men want them to. I mean, this is a horror story after all. Um, and I think that the horror part of it comes from the audience sympathizing with the women because their identities are being like brutally snatched away from them because, you know, simply because the men in their lives can't stand for them to have interests or thoughts of their own and just want to mold them into their own, you know, what they want. So to me, it's making fun of the men more than the women so i don't really know like why anybody got the idea that it was satirizing the women's liberation movement because it absolutely was not so the story uh centers on a woman named joanna who's played by katherine ross and she's an aspiring photographer she's got like a couple shows and stuff like that uh she has a husband named walter and a couple of kids i think they're both girls uh now at walter's urging the family moves from manhattan to this very idyllic seeming enclave called Stepford in Connecticut. Now, Joanna is a city girl, so she's not really all that enthused about leaving her life in Manhattan, um, but you know, she loves her husband and she's willing to give suburban life a go. Once she gets there, however, she finds she has very, very little in common with the women of Stepford. They all look June Cleaver perfect, like all the time, like their hair is completely done, their makeup is completely done, they all have those dresses and heels and pearls and the whole fucking deal, even when they're just, you know, walking through the grocery store. Also, none of them really seem to have a single interesting thing to say. Like the only things that they ever talk about are their kids, uh, housework, laundry, cooking, grocery shopping, just all these kind of housewifey type of things, and they don't seem to have any thoughts beyond that. So Joanna is understandably very weirded out by this situation, but Walter kind of encourages her, you know, this is where we live now, please try and fit in. Now, thankfully, Joanna ends up meeting another recent transplant to the community, who is this kind of lovable tomboy type uh, woman named Bobby, and she's, you know, kind of shares a lot of uh, Joanna's interests. They're both very into like women's lib, liberal politics, you know, the arts, that kind of stuff. Now, while their friendship is blossoming, Walter seems to be settling in as well, and he joins the town's men's association. Now, Joanna has a lot of misgivings about this. She's kind of like, don't you think it's kind of sexist? Like women are absolutely not allowed to join. They're not even allowed like into the building. I'm like, she's like, what the fuck are you guys doing in there? You know, that kind of thing. But um, she doesn't want to like, you know, nag or like get on his dick or anything like that. So she's just kind of like, okay, whatever. If you want to do that, then I don't like it, but whatever. Now, later on, some of the dudes from the men's association come over for a meeting. And while they're there, one of the guys like ends up drawing a very detailed sketch of Joanna. It's like, oh, he's an artist. That's what he does. It's not, it's not weird at all. Um, and then later, another member actually recruits her into some purported linguistics project that he's doing. And it entails her recording herself saying like a bunch of different words and a bunch of different like parts of words like phonemes and things like that so you know again not weird at all is it <laughs> so yeah so to joanna's horror 
uh, her previously awesome best friend, Bobby, starts to act all submissive and boring after a supposed romantic weekend getaway with her husband. And as the story goes on, Joanna begins to suspect that the men's association is doing something to the women of Stepford in order to make them more compliant and like closer to the mythical like 1950s housewife ideals. They initially think it's like something in the water or something like that, but she starts doing like an investigation. But of course, you know, nobody believes her and Walter gaslights the shit out of her, but it turns out it's even worse than she imagined. Uh, the men aren't giving their wives some drug to make them more obedient. They're straight up murdering them and building lifelike robots of them as replacements. So although this movie is funny, uh, the humor is very dark and really kind of only serves to emphasize the very chilling nature of the premise. Uh, besides that, the fact that, spoiler alert, uh, Joanna doesn't escape and is assimilated into Stepford in spite of her best efforts makes kind of like a devastating statement about the difficulty of fighting back against these kinds of kind of retrograde attitudes. I mean, maybe the Stepford Wives is generally scarier to women than it is to men. I'm not really entirely sure. I've never done a poll or anything like that. But I mean, personally, I think it's one of the most unsettling films of the 1980s. And you know, even though it doesn't seem scary on its surface, like the implications of it are very, very scary to me. Um, I would advise skipping the 2004 remake, though. Uh, it seemed to have missed the point of the entire story and was neither scary nor funny. Uh, and it was just kind of a big, dumb, empty spectacle with nothing really substantive about it. I think I saw it in the theater just out of curiosity, but I just remember really, really not liking it and thinking it was stupid. But, you know, so there's that. But the original from 1975 is, uh, is dynamite and the novel is great too. And I would also recommend that very highly. So thank you very much for coming along on this next step of the journey. Hopefully you're enjoying this ride as much as I am. If you are, please stay tuned for the next post, which of course will cover 1976. And as always, thanks for dropping by the salon. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if you like this content. I'm really trying to, you know, kind of make this channel like get bigger and all that kind of stuff. Also remember to visit scaresalon.com where there's a whole bunch more written content, book reviews, movie reviews, all kind of stuff like that that will keep you entertained for hours and hours and that'll do it for this installment i will see you guys on the next one bye